to me uh, Thursday we do have our annual business meeting so that'd be Thursday so we'll do that okay in your Bible Ezekiel Ezekiel Old Testament have any of you ever had somebody complain to you about God in that if I would only see him then I'd believe in him okay we're gonna answer that this morning so Ezekiel 18 Made it in from Wheatfield. (laughs) Ezekiel 18. I'm sorry, Ezekiel, let's go with Ezekiel 33. I think I like that one better. They're very similar. And let's go and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us to understand your words, and I do thank you for (laughs) safety on the roads, and I pray that you'd... uh, also give safety in a way home, and I pray that this would uh, be a time well spent, that uh, we're going to try to step on your side of the picture and uh, see things going on down here from your viewpoint, and I pray you'd help us to understand it and be able to explain it to others. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> okay, uh, before I read this, in this part of the Bible, you'll see before Ezekiel is a large book called Jeremiah. So you have Jeremiah, and then a very small one tucked in there, Lamentations, and then Ezekiel, and then Daniel. Okay, so those three, <clears throat> if you go take them backwards, okay, years ago when, when uh, God had gotten fed up with uh, Judah, he told Jeremiah, don't pray for these people because I'm not going to listen to you. Now, we'll see why he says that by reading what was recorded. And so what happened is that God used an army from Babylon, a guy named Nebuchadnezzar, uh, and they had an army, and they came in and attacked Jerusalem. And now they did it three times, but they didn't do it back-to-back three times. They did it the first time and and thought that that would be enough to scare them. But, you know, when uh, you're taking freedoms away from people, uh, they tend to rebel on that, so... They attacked once, and then 11 years later, they hit it again, and then five years later, they completed it. Three strikes, you're out. Okay, in the first time, in the first attack, after the battle was done, then they took captives back to Babylon, so it's about four or 500 miles, maybe even more, straight across that desert. So they took uh, around over 3,000 people that first time. Okay, of the 3,000, one of them was named Daniel. So that's the book of Daniel. So they took the upper crust, the royal seed. And then you had three other guys that were buddies of Daniel, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So then they waited 11 years, and they hit him again. And that time they took over, uh, let's see, 800 people. And Ezekiel was that character. Ezekiel was a priest. So that's... We're going to read something about the complaints that people had. And then five years later, the five years later, what they did this time around is obviously the Jews had been preparing militarily. And so what they did is they just surrounded the city. So if we take Lowell, put a fence around it, and then put an army in the outside, nobody goes out, nobody comes in. Obviously, they're going to run out of food. And so Jerusalem had enough food inside that the, the people inside survived up to 18 months. But when it got to that far down, they were run out of food and people were getting skinny. Uh, children were pre, prematurely born, premature nine foot or nine inch span of a length of a, a preemie child obviously died. And so then they would eat it. Okay, and uh, this, you know, this happened throughout the years, but the Lord said this was going to, he told them, he warned them. He said, if you keep this up, this is what's going to happen, and it did. Okay, and when the army came in, Jeremiah was the last major prophet. So you have Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. So if you take them backwards, Daniel, Ezekiel. Now, Jeremiah stayed in the city. Now, when the army came in, they said to Jeremiah, they gave him a choice. Do you want to go to Babylon with us? Do you want to stay here? And he chose to stay in the mess. Then he described it. 
So he described what he witnessed during that 18 months, and that's what that little book of Lamentations is called, Lamenting. Okay, if you're depressed, don't read Lamentations. <laughs> well, maybe it's a good one to read. You find out you don't have it so bad. Okay, and so Ezekiel now, so there's about 4,600 people that they took into three different times. Ezekiel's one of them, and no doubt these people were complaining, and they were disappointed with God. So Ezekiel 33, verse 10, will be those comments, and Ezekiel was going to defend God for what he's been doing. Ezekiel 33, 10, Therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel, thus ye speak, saying, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how, shall we, how should we then live? So they're pining away in Babylon. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I'm not happy that the wicked people are dying. I don't get a jolly out of that. I don't get a kick out of that. He said, but the wicked turned, but that, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Therefore, thou son of man, say unto the children of my, thy people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness. Neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sinneth. So the Lord is basically saying, warned him. He says, if you keep going down this path, judgment's coming. I don't get a kick out of this but it's going to happen. 13, when I shall say to the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trusts in his own righteousness and commit iniquity. Note, he's trusting in his past. I've done this in the past, but now I'm going to commit iniquity. All his righteousness shall not be remembered, but for his iniquity that hath committed, he shall die for it. Okay, now we're not looking at the Old Testament doctrine here. That's a whole different thing. 14, again, when I shall say unto the wicked, thou shalt, thou shalt surely die, if he turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right. Now, that is described back in chapter 18. If the wicked restore the pledge, that was a financial pledge, give again that he hath robbed, that's a political people and their taxation, walk in the statutes of light without committing iniquity, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of his sins that he hath committed shall be mentioned unto him. He hath done that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. Okay, now here's the complaints that Ezekiel heard. Yet the children of thy people say, the way of the Lord is not equal. As for them, their way is not equal. So they're saying, God's not equal, and God says, no, 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 I'm equal, you're not. So what's the complaint? God is unfair. God is unfair. That's the complaint that they're complaining about. So 18, when the righteous turneth from his righteous and committeth iniquity, he shall even die thereby. But if the wicked turn from his wickedness and do that which is lawful and right, he shall live. Yet ye say, the way of the Lord is not equal. O ye house of Israel, I will judge you, everyone, after his ways. Okay, so uh, a lot of times people get disappointed with uh, their circumstances in life. They get disappointed with life. And, and the reality is that often that what takes place is because when people get disappointed with uh, life or with what's happened to them in life, who do they blame? Who gets to blame? Okay, God always gets to blame. Now, we can admit life is unfair, but God is fair, and we got to separate the two, okay? And so when you get talking to people, and I've heard people say, if God would just show himself, well, let's see how that will work, okay? That's the big gripe that people often have. Now, the word that's kind of unique in here is the word iniquity versus sin. There's a difference. All iniquity is sin, but not all sin is iniquity. It'd be like all all ducks are birds, but not all birds are ducks. Iniquity is, is a pretty heavy thing, okay? And the first time iniquity is found in the Bible, it says in Genesis 15, 60, and the iniquity of the Amorites are not full. So you'd have to study the Amorites to figure out what he's talking about. And then he connects it to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the second occurrence 
So in the reason why God <clears throat> uh, blew Sodom and Gomorrah off the map is because of iniquity, not because of sin, but because of iniqu- a deep abiding sin, deeper than the average person knows. And that's why he did that. Okay, and now these disappointments in life causes often people to reevaluate their beliefs, and which is a good thing to do, <clears throat> but usually in that process is they blame God for the problems. For some reason, they don't look in the mirror. And the three basic questions that usually when you get talking to people who are disappointed with God <clears throat> or life is one, they say God is unfair. Another one, they say God is silent. I've prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, and he's not listening. And the other is they say God is hidden. If he would just show himself, then I will believe in him. I'm not buying it. Okay. Now, the unfair one is the one that the children of Israel in uh, Babylon was griping about. God is unfair. Why did he allow the, the Babylonians to come in and rip us out? Okay, now, if anybody's got a complaint on that, I would say Daniel had a complaint. 15-year-old kid, he was, uh, he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth, royal family. 15-year-old kid still ripped away from his family. Uh, probably never saw his parents again unless they were taken captive and, and then did what they did to him and tried brainwashing him for three years. But Daniel came through with flying colors. Evidently, he recognized, sure, life is not uh, fair, but at least God is. And that's the thing is to be able to separate the two, you see. And so what some people will say, since God is silent or hidden, then they will say, okay, then there is no such thing as God. And the Bible will tell us, yes, God does hide himself. He does at times. He told the Jews in Deuteronomy, and he told them several times, if you keep this up, I will hide my face from you. And when your problems come and you pray for me to rescue you, I will laugh at you because I told you I was going to do this. Now, that's a side of God that you don't want to see. Okay, but he told the Jews that on multiple occasions. And now, ultimately, that's going to happen in the tribulation. Okay, ultimately. But it did happen uh, in the Babylonian thing. In that event, that's where God did hide from them. Why does he do that? Okay, now there are a bunch of false portrayals about God. Okay, some say God is a very strict disciplinarian. He is a bully. He is ready to punish and pounce on any wrongdoing. That's what some people think. Other people think that God is uncaring. This would be a deist. God created the world, threw his hands up in disgust, say, I'm not doing anything. God is uncaring, unchangeable, uncharitable. And then others say God is permissive and weak. Okay, but when you read the Bible, you will discover by reading the Bible, instead of listening to people read the Bible, <clears throat> God is caring. He is a colorful individual or person. He is compassionate and he's very unique. He is mighty and merciful. Those are opposites. Mighty and merciful. Those don't go together. If somebody's powerful, they're usually not merciful. Jesus Christ was full of grace and truth. Those are opposites. Okay, and so that's the thing about God being colorful, uh, very unique. And the men that, the men who related to God in the Old Testament in particular, treated him like a familiar friend. That's how they treated him. Abraham was, in fact, God said, Abraham is my friend. Abraham's my, I tell you, if I were God, I'd be depressed. I would. Seven billion people on the earth, how many even care what he thinks? Wouldn't that be depressing? (laughs) People don't step on the side of God and think about this. God has deep emotions. He has delight. He has grief. He says, tells us, uh, he says that we are taught to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. God is shocked. By some of the behavior. Yeah, I know he has foreknowledge, but he is shocked how people 
treat people. If you would, try Jeremiah 19. So if you're in Ezekiel, go backwards. You know, one large book, you know, there's a mind, a little book tucked in the middle. Now, Jeremiah describes, he's a eyewitness account of why God judged that city of Judah, why God did this. And when you read what Jeremiah says, you when you read this, you'll have to say, okay, God was right in what, what he did. Jeremiah 19, verse 3. So this is an eyewitness account. He says, And say, Hear ye the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Okay, so this is a small city in, in a geographic sense as, as the size of Lowell. And there was one guy that uh, spoke up for God, Jeremiah. And so he's got everybody's attention. And on secretly the mayor or the king would secretly go over to Jeremiah and say, hey, tell me what's going on. He's, don't, tell, don't tell the press I was here, but tell me what you've heard from God. And then Jeremiah would tell him. Okay, so then he says this, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place, the which whosoever heareth his ears shall tingle. <laughs> this is going to be shocking. Why? Because... They have forsaken me. All nations that forget God shall be turned to hell. And you say, well, so what? Keep reading. And have estranged this place, that would be the temple, and have burned incense in it unto other gods. People will say, oh, he's just jealous. He just doesn't like competition. Keep reading. Whom neither they nor their fathers have known, nor the kings of Judah, ha- kings of Judah, and have filled this place, the Jewish temple, with the blood of innocents. Innocents, what? Children. They're bringing the the secret in what's been going on in secret down in the valley of Hinnon into the public arena, sacrificing children in the Jewish temple. Oh, is that enough? Is that enough to get mad? Verse 5, they have built also the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal, which I commanded not, nor spake it, neither came it into my mind. You ever hear that saying? That has never even come to my mind. And then he says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that this place shall no more be called Tophet, nor the valley of the son of Hinnon, but the valley of slaughter. Now, of all the sins in the Old Testament where they had the capital crime, a a, a capital uh, crime against a capital offense, murder on the Old Testament is is, um, punishable by death. Okay, rape was punishable by death in the Old Testament. Okay, and um, sodomy was punishable by death there, witchcraft, all Old Testament stuff. Now, the one that was brought into the New Testament where Jesus Christ mentioned one time, he implied the death sentence where he said, whosoever offends a little child is worthy to have a millstone put around their neck and throw in the depths of the sea. That's where the mafia got that idea. Okay, and so it's killing of innocent children. This is not abortion per se. This is in a religious ceremony. Abortion's bad enough, but in a religious ceremony, that's when God's had enough. He steps in for the innocent. Okay, and so uh, this is the people in Israel or the people in Babylon were griping, God's unfair. Was it fair for you people to know this was taking place and either you said nothing or you approved of it? You see why God judged them? I see why. I see exactly why God did that. Now, here's the thing about God. When you read through this Bible, God is 
desperate to love and to be loved. Is that not what each of us want? To love and be loved. How do you do that? How do you do that when you're mighty? When you're the, the creator of the universe, how do you figure out somebody to voluntarily love you? You see, and so here's the test God did. Okay, usually when people say that God is unfair, what they mean is that God is unfair to me. God is hiding from me. God is silent to me. That's what they're saying. Now, here's the initial test. When you start in the front of the Bible, in the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. Okay, and then the first day of creation, what does it say at the end of the first day of creation? And it was good. Now, the second day, he doesn't say it, but third day, and it was good. Fourth day, and it was good. Fifth day, and it was good. Sixth day, and it was very good. You know what that's like? That's like a giddy little kid drawing a picture for the first time. Mommy, look at this. Isn't that good? And she makes the mistake. That's a nice horse. That's not a horse. That's a dog. I would have never figured that out. God is saying himself what he just did. That's good. I like that. That's like a kid taking his hammer and some wood. You know, he's going out to the barn. You know what I did? And I'd make something, you know. And, you know, there's my first creation. Ain't that good? Well, a, a, a good parent will say, man, you did a good job the first time. You know, but, you know, somebody who's, you know, perfection. Oh, that stinks. I mean, you're not going to encourage uh, that child with something like that. The Lord is saying, man, that's good. And not only that, when you read other accounts where he, he throws in other things with the creation, he doesn't throw this in Genesis 1. In Job 38, verse 7, it says that the angels sang. So God creates something, the angels said, Woo, that's good, man, that's good. I like what you're doing. And so God got all this creation, all this imagination that he's trying to create, just like a child, just like somebody painting a painting. When you, if, you, if you're an artist and you paint something and somebody comes up and admires your art, doesn't your dopamine kind of go up? When somebody, uh, they come and uh, see our house, the log house that I built, cut tree, peeled, barked, did everything, you know, log garage, log house, all that stuff. Uh, you know, they say, oh, you, they say, uh, could we, could we uh, see around your house? Oh, twist my arm. Yeah, twist my arm. You know, as we're going through that, I even have to charge them a quarter to see my house. You know, the dopamine is just building. Whenever you, this is part of creating, being imaginative to build something. You see, uh, young people now, they don't have self-esteem in many ways. It's because they've not done anything. They need to learn to imagine and build something. Or, you know, a little girl, maybe she's, uh, uh, when Heidi learned how to be a seamstress, uh, you know, when the first few times you're going to mess things up. But then you get good at it. Okay, and so the idea is uh, the uh, performer, after they've done performed, and people say, well, that was good. That's an encouragement to them. You know, or if you get a, a, you know, you want to say a new car, who buys new cars nowadays? If you get an updated car, you're going you're gonna to be pleased if some, man, that's a nice looking car. Well, here God created, let there be light. Boy, that was good. Then he says, well, let's separate the waters from the waters and put this little, this domey thing. Man, that's good. I like that. And then let's make some plants. Boy, ain't that a pretty flower? I got to eat that. Did I do a good job on that? And then he gets all the animals, got all the animals done. And after he gets all the animals done, he said, you know what? What's missing? I don't have anything here that replicates me. Nothing like me. You see, he could have created a perfect world and it would have operated like a perfect machine. And that's what was happening. All the animals and the plants mindlessly follow the natural laws. But what do animals show us in their youth? What do little animals do is they play all the time. 
In youth, in creation, in the joy of creation, there's play. Always play. But what happens to a little girl who has a doll? She plays with a doll. Eventually, she puts it aside. Why? Because the doll doesn't love her back. It's just doing what she says. Okay? This is the problem God had. How do I get love, but I'm mighty? So he said, let's make something like me. Let's make a creation in my image, but I want to breathe into that creation a free will so it can rebel against me. Okay, now there's a te- that's a risk. God risked when he did that. And the risk was now if you're a sculpture, now what you the statue that you make can spit back in your face. Now your little army toys can get together and shoot back at you. Now that doll, that little girl's doll that was just mindlessly or just going where she wants, now that doll can rebel against her. You see, how, how can a person have love through force? You can't have love through force. You have to have an option. You see, a child can enjoy a toy for a time, but why do they discard it? It's because it's not responding back to them. When God introduced freedom to Adam, that was a risk of evil, a rebellion back. Will this special creation choose to love me or will this creation rebel against me? Can love and friendship arise out of freedom? Yes, it can. But you see, with the mind of the youth is when they rebel against something, they think rebellion is freedom, but rebellion has some strings attached. So what did God do in Genesis 3 when he knew that his creation rebelled against him? What would any parent do? What would any parent do when a child rebels against a parent. A parent gets involved, right? So man says, well, if I only saw God, well, Adam did. He showed up. God showed up just like a loving parent. God was disappointed with Adam. He was grieved with Adam. And now because he violated rules, he said, okay, sorry, this this is what comes with rebellion, is you've got this punishment. Boom, 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 and boom. And that's what God did. God's first test to reveal himself to somebody how to pan out. Man rebelled against him. But what a test it was. Kierkegaard writes a story, and I don't know if he realized what he was writing as a story, as a Bible story, but there was a king years ago who fell in love with a humble maiden. So she's a commoner, but a king can't marry a commoner. Now, as a king, like any king, he can force her to come to his palace and marry him. But how would he know if she loved him? You cannot force love. So that king said, trying to figure this out. I can force her to come to the palace, but I don't know if she loves me. I can force her to marry me, but I still don't know if she loves me. I can pass a law that she has to come to the palace, but how would I know that she loves me? If I just ask her, will you love me and marry me, she will do that. could be out of fear, so how would I know? So this king came to the conclusion, well, I guess what I got to do is take my robes and put them aside and become a commoner. And as a commoner, I would try to win her heart by being loving to her and kind to her, and that way I can feel she chooses to love me for who I am. Guess what our creator did? 
See, that's what he did. That's exactly what he did. How can I, God, I created Adam. If I created him like an animal, he would o- obey me like a perfect running machine. But I wouldn't know. And he could probably even program an AI, an artificial, and say, Adam, I love you, God. I love you, God. He could pull the string in the back of the doll. I love you, God. <laughs> but that's not love. And so the Lord Jesus Christ put aside his kingly, his kingly robes, his robes of deity, and became a commoner. And as a commoner, what did he show what people will do to a man who did nothing but good for three and a half years? He gave sight to the blind. He gave hearing to the deaf. He's showing what man will do if God shows up. If I would only see God, I would believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've, we've, the Bible has already shown that test. And it killed the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in that process, he's offered this gift to people who freely choose him. And when one accepts that gift, the Lord will say, it was worth it. It was worth it. I found love. I can give love, and now I'm receiving love. I passed the test. I figured it out. You see, and this is why God often, people say God's unfair. People say God's hidden. People say God's silent or secret. And that's why. The Lord's trying to discover true love back to him. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray you'd help us to see the... uh, the infinite wisdom that you have in your ideas of where we feel like you're hidden, when we are disappointed with things of life, and often this disappointment will be transferred to you, but yet people don't look at it from your perspective. And of course, you've given us a Bible so that we could look at it from your perspective, And then we can step back and see the great wisdom that you do have of seeking to love and to be loved. And when one receives the gospel message, the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, they will honor the Lord Jesus Christ and he will rejoice in that love. And a joy and a peace that will be given for a new friendship that can be developed. Well, heads bowed and eyes are closed. If you've never trusted